guys you're welcome to this wonderful event this evening um good evening from wherever you're joining us i can see quite a number of us uh connecting from kenya nigeria um okay benin city yeah you can just um uh, comment on wherever you're joining us this uh, beautiful day this is diary of hackers uh these are uh, an initiative called um cyber up 2.0 a series where the community member and the cyber security um community get to interact uh, uh, uh or fire up their skills in the industry yeah we are so privileged to have team kate in the building um they're one of the best team in the whole of Africa and also in the uh, you know world at large. We are so privileged to have you guys. They will be um, taking us through the journey of Capture the Flats. They will be sharing their experiences with us as well as um, you know uh, uh, giving us a practical insight on how to become the best city of player. Yeah, thank you, Cross, Emmanuel, Dunker. I can't actually mention all the names here. We'll have 50 people right now. I'm sure others will join. We have about 200 and 330 people that signed up for this um, event alone. So I'm so glad to have everybody. Welcome once again. And so we dive in right away. Um, you can take it out from me, Tim breaks okay uh thank you joshua yeah for, for that intro um so my name is trevor saudi i'll be filling in for our captain uh he's experiencing some tec technical difficulties but i will introduce the team and give a brief um demo on what i'm going to talk about today yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to cut you in. Um, before you go on with the demo, can you quickly tell us about your team and the success oh, you've sure achieved so far? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, my name is Trevor Saudi, and basically Team Freaks is, I'd say, a collection of around 40 cybersecurity enthusiasts, researchers, pen testers, and CTF players. And all of us were assembled by a team captain kevin koimet and i wish he was here and uh yeah so that's basically our brief intro and personally i joined the team around june and shortly after that uh is when we started having active competitions all throughout the entire year okay interesting um one more question um how is um ctf helping you guys in developing your cyber security um, skills what's the importance of playing ctf okay so the, i think the thing about um ctfs is that through different uh challenges and the categories that are there you have a hands-on practical experience on how to perform various exploitation techniques e.g in web hacking you'll frequently encounter OWASP top 10, like uh, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, secure deserialization and such during those CTFs. And these are significant things that are happening currently in the world. These are vulnerabilities that are impacting applications out there. And by gaining knowledge through these competitions, I think it's very significant towards potential careers like pen testing and bug bounty well that's interesting to note that thank you very much uh, for that brief if you have any other thing to say you can say so you had else. mentioned something about uh, the successes of the, of the team yeah yeah you I'm very happy to talk, to talk about um okay so first of all i think earlier after june this year, we were able to participate in DEFCON in a CTF that was organized by Red Team Village. It was a Red Team style CTF with a qualification round and a final round. And we emerged 16th at the qualification out of 
I'm not sure if it was more than a thousand teams, but that took us to the finals where we battled one of the best teams in the world and took 16th again. We won an OSCP voucher. Um, from then on, we went on to take first place in Cyber Talents annual competitions and also second place in the national CTFs. And we proceeded to, um, okay, the competition was the finals were to be held in Egypt, but because of COVID, we had to compete remotely. We settled, we settled for 17th. Um, recently, we did Greycon, which was also organized by Red, uh, Red Team Village. We took fourth. We won an OSCP voucher. And our recent win was Shihax Kenya, which is a cybersecurity organization in Kenya, where we took first place. Oh, wow. You have an amazing record um, so far. And I hope you will achieve more. Yeah, I'm very sure of your successes. Uh, okay, thank you so much for that exposition. All right, so we're going to dive just right in with the main purpose of, um, you know, coming here or joining it this evening. Okay, so I think I should take you on through our first category. Um, okay, first of all, um, I would like to talk about different categories that CTFs fall in. Generally, there are two, attack and defense and jeopardy style kind of CTFs. And most of the time, what we usually compete in is the jeopardy style, where we have different categories ranging from web to forensics to network security, uh, miscellaneous challenges, steganography and such. And you hack your way through to the top, basically. So I'm going to fill in for the captain and take you guys through web by showing you a hands-on um, demo on how you can go about a simple challenge that involves different things in web. Yeah. Okay, I think you can see my screen. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, very well. Okay. Okay, so there's this challenge that I came across. This is Cyber Talents. This is a one of the platforms that we use to practice in different categories. If you click on practice, you can check up these web security, malware reverse engineering, general info, network security, and all that. Very good challenges. And these are uh, good for hands-on practice and getting to familiarize yourself with different techniques in this exploitation. There's a challenge that I was initially working on and it's this. It's called, Who Am I? Uh, this is a simple category in web exploitation and i'll dive right into it so um when approaching web uh, ctfs what i like to do first the first step um is generally interact with the system and what you have before you so as you can see we are being told to enter a username and the password and uh, we can try anything admin admin well you don't get in so uh when i hit short block the second thing i do is to inspect the source and see if i can get anything uh fishy or something pointing towards a hint uh yeah so i move on to viewing the source by control u and you can see something at the bottom telling you that uh, you can log in as a guest account guest guest so I'll move in to try that. And we get in. So uh, once you're in, you can see that the site is telling us, welcome, access denied. You have no admin privileges. Please log in with an administrator account. Once uh, I usually see the site talking about privileges, in my head, that hints towards cookies i don't know why but uh, i think over the time with experience uh, through these challenges most of the time when you encounter privileges it's usually something to do with cookies and 
and move on to inspect the I mean open the Chrome developer tools and you'll see something at the cookies once you click on cookies you'll see something there and it's a cookie with an authentication um, value that is set to this so if you look at this value that is here um, okay it can click in your mind that this is definitely an encoding scheme that has been used to encrypt this particular cookie so that maybe an attacker won't be able to directly manipulate it but in this particular scenario it won't happen this way in the real world but uh, it generally requires you to apply the different techniques that web uh, security involves so um, i'll take this value right here and at the end you can see something that has been appended to it percent 3d which is a url encoding of the equal sign and uh, an equal sign appended at the end means that this is a base 64 encoded scheme so i'll take that value and move on to decode it and see what is a I'll replace the percent 3D with an equal sign, pipe it to base 64 and decode it. And you get something interesting. It tells you that the logged in value is guessed, meaning that perhaps if we are able to modify this guest value to admin, we could elevate our privileges and get admin access to this particular site. So I will take this value, guest, change it to admin, and encode it back to base 64. And since base 64 normally has this equal sign at the end, I will append it using a URL encoding just to match the format that you have in this particular application. So um, I think OpenSSL does that. I'm not so sure about the command, but um, okay, you don't have to do that through the terminal. I'll encode it through a site for the 64 encoding that I usually use. And I'm going to encode the value of admin equal login it equals to admin and replace the last equal sign with a percent 3D. Copy that back to the cookie and refresh the page and we get the flag for this challenge. So that is just a brief example of an extremely easy challenge and how you can go about these challenges and grabbing hints along the way till you get to the flag. And I think that's it for the web challenges, yeah. Okay, thank you so very much. So uh, um, the tools you use for your web, um, can you kindly tell us some tools you use for your web? Uh, Security challenges. Some of your oh, yeah, favorite, sure thing. favorite tools you use. Oh, my favorite tool is Bapsuit uh, because of the proxying capabilities and having to intercept the the what are they called the, the the requests and modifying them midway before they reach the intended target. I love Bapsuit. Um, I love uh, Dabasta, Gobasta, which are used for. Um, basically brute forcing directories of websites. I love Deer Search, which is also one of the tools for doing brute forcing. There's Dig, which is uh, for DNS lookups and things like those. There's Hydra for brute forcing logins and such. I think those are among the tools that I frequently use in CTS. And from then on, I think tools don't really matter in this case in the web challenges specifically it's your knowledge pertaining to different um i think different concepts in web like understanding the protocols like http understanding how databases work and languages like sql javascript and how they are used to interact between web servers and such so i think for you to get started with these challenges, it is important for you to have some kind of solid understanding on how to go about these different technologies. 
All right, that's that's cool. Thank you so much for the exposition. Um, um, okay, who is going next? Next, we'll be having Charles taking us through reverse engineering. Wow, reverse engineering. Okay, we'd love to hear from him. I have a series of questions to ask him when he's in. Okay. Charles, are you in? Hey Charles, are you in? Um, if Charles isn't um in for now, I think we should move on to move on to someone else who is ready. Okay, okay, cool. Is cool. uh network security ready? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, but faintly. I think your network is breaking. Okay, so I'm guessing Charles isn't around. Um, we should have another category that is ready to take on. Let me confirm with network security. I see if he's around. Okay. Um, El Elolu just text that he can do a quick demo with text. So maybe we watch the the chat box. Or probably somebody will come in before he you know, continues. He, uh, one of us is saying he's still waiting to get into the room. Okay, that's fine. Um, um, have you let him inside? Yes, yes, he's in. Uh, this is our network security guy. Although to take to take you guys through forensics also, whereby I was filling up for our captain, my specific section was forensics. Oh, okay, fine. It can proceed. Yeah. I think I'll try and proceed there before my my team gets ready for that. Uh, okay, so I'll move on to forensics. My setup wasn't ready, but I think I'll get it to work by the end of my colleagues' presentations. So. Okay, I'm moving on to forensics. I hope you can see my screen again. Yeah, very clear. Yes. Uh, okay. So, forensics and basically what is forensics about? Um, okay, you just have to operate from here. So, uh, forensics in this uh, world of CTFs are challenges that involve Okay, like when you picture forensics, what do you think of? Maybe you'll think of like detective kind of work and trying to find clues and stuff like that. Although, um, according to my personal opinion, um, I wouldn't say that most of what happens in forensics 
pertains to to the real world but okay it doesn't really map to any particular job role in the security industry although some challenges model the kinds of tasks that are seen in incident response and i'll show you what kind of challenges those are uh okay so i'll dive right in from the slide uh, you can see that what we just talked about some kind of detective stuff and processing hidden pieces of information out of static data files. So forensics is a really broad category and can be broken down into the following. There's memory forensics, file format analysis, steganography and pickup analysis. Memory forensics involves analyzing memory dumps from the computer. And from these memory dumps, you are supposed to come up with or maybe like answer some particular questions uh, in the CTFs. Maybe you've been asked about um, rogue applications or malicious applications that were initially running and you want to find the process IDs and stuff like that. We have tools that can help you pinpoint malicious activity or perform analysis on memory dumps uh, that have been collected from the computer. Next, we have steganography. Um, I'd say it's kind of uh, my my thing because I find most of these challenges are repetitive, and I've done so many to a point that I'd look at this challenge and pinpoint the tools that this challenge needs. Although sometimes we get stuck because uh, some challenges may require automation and Python scripting but on a good day uh, you might end up getting a solution in a really short time you can divide steganography into two audio steganography and image steganography in audio steganography we have messages being hidden within audio in image steganography you have messages being hidden within images next you have file format analysis inside file format analysis um Okay, when you talk about file format analysis, you're basically talking about identification of different file formats and using different tools to, should I say, to validate whether this file format has been done correctly. I'm not so sure how to to talk about this, but I'll, I'll show you through a practical example. I'll move in into my downloads and see if I have an image. Um, yeah, I think I have one, flag.png. Uh, okay, so in file format analysis, one of the first steps for you to approach these particular challenges is to analyze the kind of file that you're dealing with. This command file basically tells you that what type of file are you dealing with? I'm dealing with a PNG image data file. And this image may be corrupted and my work in this particular challenge may be to correct the bits that this particular flag has. And for you to identify whether this PNG image has been interfered with, you could use tools like strings to check. Uh, okay, strings basically gets all, all the readable strings that can be found within this particular image. And you can see there's a lot of gibberish. Sometimes flags may be hidden within this particular uh, image. We have um, tools like hex editor and hex editor basically allows you to view the particular bytes that are coinciding with what your, your, your image, the data of the image is. And during um, file format analysis is a category called file carving where you have to identify um, whether the bits have been interfered with and this is something called magic bytes magic bytes basically identify the headers and the footers and they tell you if this particular header is a png image if i search for this 89504e uh, on the internet it will tell you that this is a png image it may be modified in your particular challenge and you'll have to correct the bits to come up with a valid image. And that's basically what 
uh, file format analysis involves. Pickup analysis is anal analyzing packet captures, which um, it's basically like in a network during communication, you may capture packets during the analysis and presented uh, it's presented to you in form of a pickup file and you can go through the file and try and identify whether um, there are flags inside or something of the sort. I can't really go deep into these categories because my colleagues are about to present. But over here, I was able to do like a mind map of all these categories and the tools that most of them um, involve. I, I don't know if, um, let me try and see if I can reach this particular image and just open it up here. Not sure what I saved it under, but I think I'll send it in the chat if that's possible. So you guys can have a look at this um, later or maybe take a screenshot. But this is what forensics basically involves. It's all analysis. Uh, I give useful links and sites of tools that I use for this forensics and sites where you can find these particular challenges. But uh, I let one of us take over before I show you a demo of a forensics category. So I think I should let someone take the mantle. All right, who's ready? Uh, who's the ready? These guys are good. Let's get to work. A hot little startup with a great idea. Their target, a propass. Offices in 12 countries, 5,000 staff. You'd think they'd be secure, wouldn't you? Make some noise. A smoke screen, a decoy breach to hide what they're really after. A secret hidden guys in the depths of the system. I guess. What? Come on. Still here? Ah, uh, the computer's oh, no See you Monday. Right now, the chances are that someone this is somewhere is attacking us. We did that we don't even know. Okay, chaps. Thanks. Where is? But you're wondering how they got this far. A smoke screen. A decoy breach to hide what they're really after. Give us a smile. Lovely. She's in. sensitive encryption codes from a keystroke reader hidden under a desk for six months. We got it? Easy. These guys, they know it all. Except, a few weeks earlier, a probass were hit by a smaller breach. It made them stop and think how vulnerable they were. So they brought in the experts. They carried out security awareness training and brought in their own ethical hackers to tear up the systems and predict a worst case scenario. Proactive threat intelligence. They reviewed the whole business and devised a game plan for any breach. Make some noise. Ooh. We're in. It's a denial of service attack. We're just monitoring the situation. Someone else bangs on the windows while you hide in the cellar. They're on to us. I'll try blocking them. 
Is it working? I don't know. Well, I need to know, Gil. Is it working? Lena, launch a worm. These guys are good. They're really good. They're blocking us. Try again. They're blocking us. Let's try again. Come on. Straight to me. Gotcha. Good, but not good enough. You're okay. Traffic's blocked. You can win, but there's always a next time. Who's next? Kobashi Tech. Criminals just get smarter. Who have we got for the smoke screen? Take your pick. And they're everywhere. A breach will happen. And when it does, will you be ready? Hey guys, we're back again um, from the short break we had. Um, so, Sim Freak will be, will continue their journey. Um, yeah, on the training as well. We're still on introduction to uh, capture the flag with Sim Freaks. Yeah, with Sim Freak. So, uh, I'm just gonna allow them speak. The next presenter, please, I'm sure he's ready. Uh, hi, everyone. Hey, hi. Um, You're welcome. I hope, uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you can all hear me. Very audible and clear, yeah. OK, so I'll be checking you through um, binary exploitation and that's spawning applications. So um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, I, I, ho I hope you can all see my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll be taking you through um, how to point binaries. So I'm Gilbert from Freaks, Team Freaks. And uh, so let's move on. So here is an, an overview of what you're going of what you're going through. So um first um we'll go to we'll we'll understand what are pawn challenges. Then we ask ourselves what should we learn pawning. Then from there um we ask we we look at um the examples in real world requirements and an example for a demo. Okay, so what are pawn challenges? So these are challenges that test your skills in bypassing security mechan mechanisms inside, inside systems. <laughs> in a CTF, usually given a binary with some bug that you have to exploit to gain a shell and read the flag to gain points. Okay, so um, we have the following screenshot. I hope you can all see it. So this is a, this is a screenshot. This is a screenshot that was taken from a certain CTF. We're going to go through it. So we can see that it has the number of souls and the name of the challenge, points. You also have a quick description. <clears throat> and then you have a network connection, that's a netcat connection. Then you have our binaries. You have, for this challenge, we are lucky we are given the source code. Then you have the field for, for submitting our flag. Okay, so on the next question, we ask ourselves, why should we learn pony or binary exploitation? So do you, do you want to be cool like the guy below? Or do you want the, C the CTF team to think you're smart like this guy? But anyway, <clears throat> in real sense, here's why you should learn pony. You'll be able to write secure code and bug bounties. We have various bug bounties where, where people find bugs in browsers,
Chrome, Firefox, and all that, all those applications, Skype. So um, it also adds something on your resume when you're looking for a job. We are able to rate also, we are able to rate exploits, and also it's fun, it's fun, it's fun pony application. And so let's go on the next slide. So in real world, we have um, penetration testing, um, POC development or proof of concept, previous escalation, code editing, and bug bounty, as you talked earlier. So let's look at the requirements of starting over pawning or binary exploitation. So this challenge, uh, these challenges are mainly written in C and C++ languages. So you should therefore have an understanding of the languages. Reverse engineering skills are also important because um, not all the time are you given the source code. So you also have to reverse engineer. You should be good at writing scripts in Python. And most importantly, you should be creative. Okay, so these are some of the bugs that are mainly in CTFs. So we have buffer overflows. It's, it's the common one and the popular bug in binaries. We also have former string bugs and heap overflows. Um, so I'm going to show you a demo, and um, th that was a previous. It was a previous, previous CTF. So this was the source code, but I'm going to show you a demo. So let us let us first go through the steps. So first, we're supposed to download the given binaries. Okay, so for a moment, I'll stop sharing that screen. Um, a minute. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to share this. Okay, see, so as you can see here, we have binary exploitation. We have general skills, reverse engineering, cryptography, forensics, as, as we talked about earlier and also have web. So I'm going to solve this simple challenge on binary exploitation, that's the first challenge. So as you can see, as, as you've seen earlier on the screenshot, we are provided with two files. We are provided with one file here called greater, that's the binary, the compiled binary, and we have the source code that is written in C. So we're going to exploit this, um, we're going to split this challenge and get a flag. So, mm -hmm. I'll stop sharing that. Uh -huh. Then, mm -hmm. I'll share this. So, I hope you can all see the screen. Yeah, we can. Well, can you just um, um, zoom it in a bit? Oh, cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, so uh, we are going to list the directories. I I already downloaded them, so we can read the source code and and fuzz it a little bit to get the idea and the bug. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to so as you can see here, we all know the headers that are in C. We have two headers. So this was a simple challenge. All you had to do was call this was call this function. We can see the win function. All it does, it reads the flag from the server. You can see it it opens a file that's called a flag.txt and it reads the flag. Then it gives us the flag and closes that file. So, and you also have the main the, the main function. This is what it does. It asks you for your name. What's your name? It gets the name and it prints. Hello there. What is your name? So here's where we have to be creative. Um, we all see that that this challenge is 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 vulnerable to a buffer overflow. This is because it asks for your name. You can see here gets name without checking for, without sanitizing our input. 
So how can we overflow this to call win to call the win function to get the flag? So um, I'm going to show you a little trick. So this is what this is what I use. Uh -huh. This is the tool uh, that I use to debug it. It comes with Linux. You can use it to debug elf binaries. So we're going to disassemble our main function. Uh -huh. As you can see, we have assembly. So this is a requirement if you want to get into Pony. We can all see assembly language. So what we're looking for is our get function, as you can see it here. So we want to get the offset, the offset to the to the return address. You should understand them um, at the stack and the calling conventions in C. So we're going to disassemble our program. Um, um, sorry. So we're, uh, we're going to break. Then we enter our name. We just enter a long string. So this is what this is what is called the stack. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. uh, this is what is called the stack. As you can see here, we have something called RIP. This is the return address. As you look into the stack, here is where the return address is supposed to be. And you know it's an it's a buffer overflow. So it means we can overwrite all this to overwrite the return the return address or the RIP register in assembly. So we are going to override this and call and call our win function. So let's get the address of win function. So we are going to print it. Uh -huh. I hope you can see it. I hope you can see the address. It's here. So we are going to get our offsets. That there's something called an offset. This is the difference between our starting address here and the address of our of our RAP or the return address. This is here. So we're going to do this. Uh, we minus this address. And you can see our offset is 72. So if you have 72 A, 72 A's, this is, these are A's in hex, hexadecimal. So if you have 72 A's plus the address of win, it will give us the flag. So we're going to, to write a little Python script to show that. So I'm going to call this exploits. I'm going to use Python 3. Uh, I'm going to install a mod, a mod. I'm going to import a model. It's very useful in pointing. Uh, so yeah, these are all the functions and everything in the model. So we are going to first test it locally. We're going to test it locally and see what you got. Uh, we have our name greater. Then we remember our offset was 72. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, I can hear some, some, someone talking in the background. Oh, it's okay right now. So we remember we had our offset was 72. And uh, so this is what you're going to do. We are going to get the address, uh, the address of main. So this is how we get it. So we rem so we are going to create a long string. So this we're going to turn it to the offset to give us seventy two is now. And this is Python three. So we have bytes. Uh, so we have the address of win. Uh -huh. So we're, we're going to, to to get to get our inputs, and then you're going to send it. Then you're going to interact with the shell. So let's run it to see what you got. Uh, sorry, explain it. 
So let's wait and see. So we can see here, we have congratulations, here is your flag, but we are running it locally. So um, we don't have a flag right now. So um, let me run it <coughs> remotely and so that we can see how, how pointing works and how we get our flag. Remember, it's a netcat connection, so you're going to run it remotely. So let me get uh, the, uh, the link provided. Yeah, so you're going to paste it there. So right now we can now run this. And I hope you can all see our flag. Congratulations is your flag. Yeah, I hope. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. So we now have our flag and yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Although uh, <laughs> someone said it looks like uh, an Indian language. <laughs> oh, yeah, so since you have asked, um, you know, different categories. Oh, oh, oh I mean, yeah. um, I mean, it can I share some some links for for anyone who wants to get into. Sure, sure, sure. Please kindly drop the yeah, link yeah. on the chat box. Yeah. I've shared them, so so yeah, we are, we, are, we are good. I hope you're all good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. So, uh, you have any question for him? Okay. This is a question. I don't know if you can really answer it. It says, uh, okay, okay, it's been answered already. So the platform that he can use to practice his uh hacking skills. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've shared the links. Right. All right, so thank you so much. If there's any question, it will be directed to you before um, the end of the session. Oh, oh good. Yeah, yeah, so uh, we go on a quick break. Then when we return, we'll continue um, with the next presenter.
Okay, hi. Hey, hi. You're welcome. Um, okay, so I wanted to take you guys through a demo of in our past CTF, how you can approach similar problems. Mine won't be as <laughs> complicated as what he but showed that the uh, mastering tools and basically how good are you at googling and finding these things where they're hidden deep within the web so i'll show you one example of one of these um challenges okay so uh we had a CTF some days ago i think two weeks ago and it was called um razi razi ctf and in razi ctf we had a challenge in the steganography category um this challenge was called goblet of fire i bet there are a couple of people here who've watched harry potter before and there's this uh, movie i think it's the fourth one called goblet of fire where yeah you know the plot if you've watched it and we have a hint that you are given before we started the challenge. This is CTF time. You should check this um, website out. It basically agglomerates all the CTFs that are going to happen. And um, I think, I don't know how to put it, but it shows you upcoming events. There's an archive of previous events has write-ups of different challenges that those events are in. You should really check this site out. And I found the archive of this challenge that you are working on. So we are being told that I think Granga is smart enough to help you solve this challenge. Might be a hint, might not be a hint, might be a rabbit hole. So we should just move directly into um, analyzing what this particular steganography challenge is about. And for that, I think uh, I usually document and make like folders so that I can keep track of what we've been doing uh, through the past. And what we worked on was here. This this is it. Goblet to fire the txt. So I should just open the file, and you can have a look at what this file is. And if you look at it, um, wait, it's not a really good view. Open it with yeah. and it's just text from a certain page of the book and we have this story so what comes to your mind is uh, there's a flag, the flag that has been hidden within this text file but how am I going to get this flag if you look at this particular text file you'll see something very fishy um there's something happening after line 31 and we have blank lines tabs and indentations and if i select all you'll see it clearly that there really is something hidden within this file and i can show you by proving this is some code i was writing before if i were to select all it ends at line 63 because that's where the text is reaching but if i were to select here it's ending at line 36 meaning there's hidden stuff inside so um assuming i'm a beginner and i have no experience at all in solving this particular challenge is how would i go about this the first thing i will just jump into google and try and see what i can scourge off the internet what tool uh, would I be re uh, required to use to solve this particular challenge? I think I should do that through here. And okay, so if I were to look at this, I can see that we have spaces and tabs within this particular file, and I'm not sure what is happening. So I just append that steganography and see if I can find um, anything interesting. So I come across this particular tool that they're talking about called Stegsno. And 
you can read about Stead's no here, it's telling you that it's a program for concealing messages in text files by appending tabs and spaces on the end of lines, which is exactly what we have here. Um, hmm, so how do we decode this particular file? So I scroll down through the man page, which is manual page, and we can see something here. The following command will conceal the message I'm lying in this file and encrypted with this password. The resulting text will be stored here. To extract the message, the command will be this. So if you type stags no, um, tack, capital C, tack P, hello world out file, hello world being the particular password to this file will extract uh, the message successfully. But in this particular case, I'm not sure what the password is. What am I? So we move directly into uh, Stag, Stagsno. I had initially installed it through pip. I think, I'm not sure if it's pip, um, three install Stags. Yeah, one of those commands, that's not the one, but you can do something and install the whatever. So um, I'm not sure what the password is, right? So what happens if I just pipe that in? I get gibberish. Um, in this particular case, I'm stuck. I know the particular tool that I need to use to extract the message, but I'm not sure um, what else is needed. If I go back to this challenge and read through again, you see something saying that um, I think Granga is smart enough you solve the challenge why exactly is this particular character being mentioned maybe uh, this could be the password to extract in this file the message in the file so if i were to append that as the password If I need quotes, I get the flag. Let me repeat that. So if you just pipe that in with this particular password, you end up with the flag for the challenge. And that's how you approach the steganography challenges. If there is a specifically with steganography. There's nobody else to uh, presentation. I, I think I've been to showing you guys about an audio challenge. Farm if there's anyone. Okay. Um, so, Tim Freak, I think I've sat with the two presenters. We'll be moving to um, Google Meet. So, this will just redirect everybody. I'll be dropping the link now so the other presenters can take off from there. They are already in the room already waiting for us to join in so they could kick off with their training. Is that fine? Audible. So, um, start sharing the slides and... Um... So I said earlier, I'm taking you through reverse engineering. And before we get to that, let me explain the basics of reverse engineering. So um, reverse engineering is um, simply uh, the, the, the process of taking a compiled code or maybe a program. Let's say it's a binary, maybe it's an executable, like uh, um, a Windows EXE or a Templar or... Um, uh, the compiler to view uh, the source code or okay something close to the source code or the assembly code that it it gets converted to when the compiler compiles the, the source code to the executable. So very often the, the goal of uh, reverse engineering is just to understand the functionality of the program so that you can either ident identify the uh, vulnerabilities or maybe a bug or create a key gen you see the cracked programs you have to understand reverse engineering so that you can crack the programs okay so the basics of uh, reverse engineering require you to have some knowledge in assembly so let's see what assembly is 
Okay, assembly or machine code is just uh, the code that has been formatted in a way that the machine will understand. You know, machines do not understand languages like us human beings do. They understand um, assembly code. Or, okay, they understand machine code. Uh, so assembly code or machine code is just a language that the, the computer or a machine just directly understands uh, and it's uh, processed by the CPU. So you have to understand assembly code. And then the other thing you need to have is C knowledge. So C is a programming language. I was written by Dennis Leachy in 1970. So we won't get to all that history and stuff. But in CTFs, we mostly use programs uh, written in C. Why? Because C is a low level programming language meaning that um it directly okay not directly necessarily but um the steps involved in uh compiling c language are simpler as compared to other language high level languages like python java php and what have you so c is very close to machine language like um a, a c code has both um okay like now when you're programming with a high level language let's take for example for instance Python, it means when you, okay, a Python is interpreted, so let's take Java. When you compile Java into machine code, uh, the code will take, um, the compilation of the code will take maybe some time to compile, but, and and execute execution time will be slow, but on C, a compilation time might be long and all that, but um, execution is very fast. So C is optimized for speed, but I'm not here to to talk about the speed of programming languages and all that. So uh, here we have a sample of a disassembled program. And we can see this is the C code used to write it and the assembly code on reverse engineering. This is the X64 DBG. So uh, it, it converts the original C code. This is the source code. Now when you feed the program, uh, that you want to disassemble or reverse engineer, it gets con converted from the source code to the assembly code. So for you to do reverse engineering, you need to have uh, certain tools. We call them the hackers arsenal. So as for me, I'm specialized in reverse engineering and I do mostly uh, e reverse engineering on ELFs. I'm not that good in Py executables, that is the Windows uh, kind of programs. So I'm mostly specialized in uh, uh, reverse engineering Linux distro executables like the ELLs, APKs for Android and such. So the tools that I use, we have strings. Now strings is quite a uh, useful program in capture the flag challenges. Uh, it, can it, it can enable you to literally, let's say most of the things uh, use strings. Like when you write a program, you're using strings, the, the, the lines of codes, that is just strings. So strings is a good, uh, very good and important uh, program in your hacking distro. So let me demonstrate how we use strings on a um, challenge that I found. Let's find one challenge that I can demonstrate on. We can either take a hack the box or maybe Pico CTF. So I'll start with Pico CTF. Oh boy, this is bad. So let's refresh the page and whoa. Okay, then then I'll go to hack the box and see if we can solve a challenge on reverse engineering using strings. Okay, we have one here, baby RE. So uh, the challenge description tells us to show your basic skills, exclamation point. So there are four ways to solve this. Are you willing to try them all? So we have a zip over here is supposed to download and we have the sh S S okay SHA 256. This is just to verify that the downloaded stuff is authentic. So I already downloaded this. So let's get to the oh uh, okay the, the 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 password of the zip file is hack the box. So let's just copy that one and go directly to the downloaded uh, file and see what we can do on it. Oh. Okay, so my PC might be sluggish due to storage and RAM, all that, so help will bear with me. So we go to downloads, and then um, I believe I placed it in some, oh, DOH, here we go. 
So ah, uh, actually have it. I have uh, literally the unzip the file. So he's the executable. So in Linux operating systems, you don't just run an executable by just double clicking on it. That won't work. Instead, you'll view the source. Okay, the the, the compiled code, which will be just gibberish, and you'll understand nothing from that. So to run the code, you can use the terminal or the um apt installer and such kind of stuff so let's open the terminal and um this down what we have in this directory so as you can see we have this baby now to run the baby okay the baby is now the executable to run it actually you can just check if it's um executable by using kata kata is a tool that is embedded into radia 2 if most of you guys, okay, let's assume uh, you haven't been doing CTS. So, Kata is a tool embedded in Radia. Radia is a, is a disassembler. Let's call it a disassembler. It's quite advanced and such an interesting hacking tool that has infinite possibilities of reverse engineering stuff. So, we can either use Kata uh, to view the, the disassembled code or just let's let me just demonstrate the, how string works. So, you just type in string. And then, oh, supposed to be string. And then, then the name of the executable. So it's baby strings. And then we'll see all the strings that are inside this uh, executable. We have all this gibberish. Now, the flag has a certain format. Let's say it starts with, okay, we can assume it starts with the name flag or the name of the for example, we got this uh, executable from Hack the Box, so they can use the header as the, the, the initials of Hack the Box, like HTB. So when you're looking for a flag in uh, an executable, you're looking for something peculiar in curly braces, something that makes sense somehow. So uh, if you have the basics of how flags are captured, you, you just identify a flag. Oh, here you have the flag. HTB baby river whatever whatever so we need to get a clearer view of this uh, flag we just use strings and got this flag so let's see if we learn we, we run the executable if uh, we'll have something a challenge or something like that so I'll just try to run the executable to run it you must make you must give it run permission so you just type in ch ch mod and then all the permissions and it's baby then run it so it has the permissions and when you list down you can see it has a change in color like it's i don't know somehow a light bit greener than the other one so to run it use the uh, dot and the comma okay the full stop and the <laughs> backslash symbol and then the name of the program so you do that with run. So they're asking for a key. What might be this key? Hmm. Let's try the uh, and then try again later. Oh, that is weird. So let's give it a try. We just saw something that looked like a flag. So maybe if we inserted that as the 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 the, the key, we can get the flag. So let's try that. Um, where was it again? Um. Hmm. It was somewhere here, HTB, reverse, wow, wow, wow. Oh, they're even telling us don't run strings on this challenge. That's not the way. So, <laughs> and then insert key, A, B, C, D, blah, 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 blah. Let's try this. So it's A, B, C, D, wow, wow, wow. Now we copy this. And get back to the program. We run it again. We did the key. And... Voila, we have the flag, so it's HTB, baby rev, that's easy in some weird format. So we have a flag. That's an example of how you solve a simple uh, reverse engineering CTF using strings. Okay, we just didn't use strings, but this time I were involved. So let's get down to other challenges that I had uh, downloaded before and see how we can use uh, the disassemblers and what have you. So... Among the hackers' tools, the, the hacking tools they used in uh, reverse engineering, we have Ltrace. Now, this, the Ltrace and Ltrace just show the dynamic 
uh, links and shared links or whatever, how they're interacting the program, how the, the, the program does system calls and such, like using functions uh, such as printer. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Yeah, thank you for that. You are now. Okay, so where are we? we are on L trace and S trace. So these two are used to show system calls and dynamic link calls and what have you. So we can you just it just like um let's call it a wrap. It just wraps around the program, and then when the program runs, you can just see how the program is interacting with the system and such. So let's try our uh, L trace on this challenge that we just sold. So you just print, okay, okay just maybe um, L trace, and then the program. And then you have, please insert key. So we have the system called F gets, which means uh, we have to insert something inside. So let's try and insert the key that we found. And we have uh, this put. Now, th this means that the program, when it runs, uh, it puts out, okay, it puts out this string. This is a system called the puts. And then uh, it gets this string from somewhere using this function f gets. You can see this function, this function f gets. So it gets the string, this or whatever, from somewhere maybe in the program. And then uses this string comparer. So it compares if this code that we have inserted, the key I mean, is um, equal to something stored inside the program. And then prints out using the puts function. This is still a system call and try says try again later okay, that is weird so and the program exists ex exits uh with status zero which means it exited with an uh no errors okay that's good so uh we just saw that the functionality of how strings is useful in or uh, reverse engineering and l trace s trace does uh, more so the same so we won't get into that and then we have ida pro now this is a premium um tool that you have to purchase from hex race and it's quite expensive if you're doing ctf so i wouldn't re recommend you to use this uh, but there is a free community version uh, which i'm using and uh, a premium version which i have on my uh, windows machine but uh, let me demonstrate how either look, looks like on um, the community version how it looks like and how it works so i'll Turn on a terminal and then where did I place it? Oh god, oh, this is weird. I think it's oh, we have a shortcut in the desktop. So mm -hmm. let's see the desktop, the desktop of oh, too many tabs. Mm -hmm. So here's the desktop. We have Ida, this is the free version. So Let's see how it looks like and um, tells me some, I don't know, it's free. But it's so to disassemble um, an executable, something, just drag and drop it over here so we can we can try that on the baby, baby RE that we just uh, sold. So here it is. We'll just drag and drop it on IDA. So, okay, let's drop it over here on IDA and see what happens so yes 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 the default values and what all that so ida has a graph view which shows you how the program gets executed and this is very important if you're running a huge program you know not it's not always uh reverse engineering doesn't only entail uh reverse engineering such simple programs like uh baby words like this that, that we just saw you can have a program that has billions of dynamic uh, binary calls and such, but uh, I'll just demonstrate. So this graph view helps you visualize how the program, uh, okay, just helps you have a clear understanding of, on the program full, flow, I mean. So if you required maybe to, you can see now, this is a decision tree. The red one means uh, if the program fails, okay, let's try to analyze now on a reverse engineering base of view. Now we have when you run the program, it prints out. Okay, this is embedded in um, in the program. So when you run it, it it pushes uh, this okay to the screen and says insert key. After that, 
it compares uses RSI, pushes this to the RSI, and then that's a stri string compare. So this string compare means we have this string compared to the string that you insert in the program. And now if the string matches, it uses this direction, this uh, flow to the next one. So it tries, it calls in uh, this puts function and prints out try again later if you succeeded, I think, yeah. Or oh, yeah, yeah, if you, you succeed and then if you fail, it goes the other way and um prints out uh the value that was stored in the REX. That is interesting. And then um this is how it exits and ends the program. So Ida helps you visualize all that and then you have, can have the hex view if you looking for some strings in the binary and salts. You can see the imports now. The program imports all these libraries. String compare. This is the the, the, the function that compares the strings stored in the in the binary and the string that you input. And then we have all these other uh, functions. I I mean libraries. Oh, we have fget. Now this is used to maybe get a string from somewhere and print it out. So yeah, that's what we have for Ida. And then let's move to the other tool. I don't want to save the database. Okay. So the next tool was um, GDB. Now this is the new debugger. Okay, actually this is used for uh, more of dynamic analysis. The IDA Pro and the, the the strings are used for static analysis. Now S trace and L trace. These do uh, dynamic analysis or so interact with the program and see how it behaves to certain responses how it behaves to certain inputs so maybe you can be trying a buffer overflow you'll use these to see a uh, segmentation error i don't know if i have a sample of a buffer overflow um nope i just have strings oh uh, this one looks interesting oh so in reverse engineering you need some uh basic shell coding uh knowledge like you you can make some programs to run on bash that will help you solve the problems like now here uh the 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 the, the problem is strings okay the, the the ctf is strings so we definitely know when we run strings we'll get the string so to automate stuff you just identify the name of the the uh, the platform that you're running on let's say this I got I think I got this one from Pico CTF so you just uh, make a, okay if you are um, a Linux user you know how to use grab to find in strings in between stuff and sort them out so I, I made this script let's see how it looks like to grab in the program using strings okay it runs strings so here you have the header bin bash which means the the, the it tells the the computer that okay the machine that should use a bash environment and then runs strings pipes it to grab and grabs out for anything to do it because it helps. so let's try and run it and see if it will work out so i'll i won't find another terminal i have two already going on so let's debug oh and um this down one we have in here we have oh string so change directory to strings and what we have here we have uh, get flag and string so when we run strings on um well what just happened strings on strings we should get a lot of data now Moving through this data will consume a lot of time and energy. We have all this gibberish. We can differentiate the flag from all this uh, stuff. So we use grep. Now you can typically just print in strings and then this pipe this to grep and grep for maybe let's try. Let's assume we're solving stuff. So we grab for a flag and run it. So we have uh no flag on that so we grab for another one let's try pico ctf pico i just pico here we have a flag strings save time yeah strings do save time they do save time and energy so 
also I made this script, let's nano it and oh I just showed you how it well, it looks like so to run it you can either use bash and then uh, get flag dot psh and then when you run it you just get the string. So uh bash and python are very good uh they, they actually are the hackers sword or maybe this um, let's call them the hackers they used they used in uh, automating stuff and making uh, all this hard work get easier so let's move on to the next thing so so gdb to run gdb on terminal you just type in gdb and then feed it the program that you want to run it on let's try okay now if if you by at any chance you don't know how to use a tool that is on uh let's say a linux distro you just type in gdb okay the, the name of the tool uh followed by two two what do you call them two not underscores two minus signs and then help you'll get um a list of maybe a small manual of how to use stuff and then to get more information you can use man man so man gdb and you'll get uh, some basic information. Wait, wait, okay, you have no manual for GDB. So you can just Google it out to see how to run GDB and how to use it on stuff. I just saw my colleague um, who presented on Pwn um, demonstrate how to use GDB, so I won't get into that. That will be repetition. So the other one is Binary Ninja. This is an open source tool, I believe, but it has a, no, it's, it's not open source. I think it there is a, a community version and um a premium version so let's see how the community version looks like i believe i have it i've used it a couple of times to solve stuff so it's quite useful and let's try binary 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 ninja then we have the binary ninja mm -hmm. So we run it and see how the interface looks like. It's quite fancy. Uh, we can start it as a dark theme. So we, this is the demo version. That's awesome. I think we have to agree to the terms and all that stuff. So we just, okay, we can open um, an existing file. Maybe the file that we had on. Uh, on baby reverse engineering I was in downloads let's scroll down to downloads and then um created a folder named diary of hackers dh you have it oh and we can let's try on this one so open and we can see the program how the program just does it so it's it runs um so we can run. Uh, oh we have the the windows option here you can switch between this is now the assembler code view you can switch to um symbol list or oh, this is just shows the symbols used in the program but let's not get into that i won't go that don't uh, run that deep into this i just wanted to show the basic view of binary ninja so Let's move on to the next tool. The next tool is um, Radea. Oh, this is my favorite. I love Radea. This actually has more than, I don't know, five tools. We have it's uh, it's me. It mainly designed to run on the on the on the terminal. So when you just call it Radea or you use R2 to call it, it will just run. And then you can see how to use it. You can use it followed by I don't know all this crap crap. So let's try to run Radea on the strings file or maybe the BBRE file. So I was in downloads and then I was in um, Diary of Hackers. And um, let's try which one. We can run L2 on run. So this shows the a starting address of the the program uh if you want to get help in radial because it's the terminal type of dinghy you can just print in a question mark and you get all the options to use it so the first thing you do to a program like 
maybe this one you just auto increment and auto name and all that stuff so use triple a auto auto name and auto increment so this just assigns the functions you know when you're trying to reverse engineer uh, the, the the code that you get won't be necessarily close okay it won't be necessarily looking alike uh to the code that the source code that was used to make the program so um we have some ASLR and all that stuff that is used to make the 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 program names and they are assigned values jump and that makes it hard to reverse engineer stuff but uh, let's not get to that actually so I'll just I just wanted to show you how uh, this run so you just run R2 and then to exit you can type on Q then it will exit. So it also has our, um, what do you call it? A graphical in user interface interface version. It's known as Cutter. So you just type in Cutter. Oops, Cutter. And type communities. And then the name of the program. So it was run. And you wait. I don't know. Cutter installed. That is weird. So maybe it's my 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 shell. Mm, I used to run stuff on fish. So fish. Let's try to run Kata. Damn! I uninstalled Kata. Oh my goodness! I should pinch myself so hard. So, but to run Kata, it's a tool inside Radia. It's a part of Radia. I don't know how I installed it. That is weird. Maybe my PC is is daydreaming. I, I don't know. So uh, that is just an overview of Radia. It has some interesting tools if you deep dive. You dive deep into it. So, and then we have Hopper. Oh, this is so good because um, it gives you an overview of the C like source code. So I have Hopper over here. That it's a disassembly. It just converts the code, uh, compiled code into a machine code and then it can try to uh, convert it into the original source code in the format of C or C++. So uh, it's a premium version, but you still have a community version that you, you can run on and it's quite awesome. So let's try to run these uh, strings. Okay, what, whichever you have on Hopa and see how it goes like. So we drag it to Hopa. Yeah, and brief all that. And here you have all the libraries that were used. This is the starting of the program, I believe, or maybe the main. So when you analyzing stuff, you either start from, you either start looking for such keywords like start, maybe the main, since this is the entry of the program, and um, this is where it begins. So you have a basic understanding of. Um, how the program will be running and such kind of things. So this is Hopa to view the, the source. Okay, the, the C version of the source code, I believe you yes, control and J. It's been a while since the last used Hopa. So I uh, can't remember the movement around. So ah, let's just move on to the next tool before I waste too much time. I think I'm using too much time to explain stuff of just moving over and over so we have pwn tools pwn tools now this is something so incredible use python to run on pwn tools i don't know if i have a sample of um program that i have used pwn tools in just show you it doesn't have uh um okay let's let's view pwn tools as um a library you just call it and then it automates stuff for you so it's not like a program, it's more of a, a, a library that you use with other languages such as Python. Uh, most of the times I've used it on Python, but I believe it can run on other programming languages. But um, let me see if, I, oh, I believe I have it in Buha Overflow. Yeah, this must be, must have used uh, Ubuntu. So see now, you just import it as a library and then you start using its tools. It has, um, P64. Now this converts. Uh, it converts. Um, what do you call it? 
Jesus. Um, it convert, converts. Um, <laughs> oh God, let's just keep, skip that because my brain is now getting fuzzy. Getting fuzzy. Let's get down to the other tool, which is Ghidra. Mm, Ghidra is so awesome. It was designed by the NSA to reverse engineer stuff. And it's quite a powerful tool if you know how to use it. But I do hate it quite somehow because it creates redundant files and um, a lot of junk in your system that will just fill up your stuff. So, oh, I'm not here to describe my program. So let's run Gildra and see how it looks like. So, um, let me close this terminal. Go find my, uh, let me go to home. Wait, what did I just do? And then I move to Gidra. Wait, I don't have such. That is weird. I want to have Gidra in my sense. Whoa! I have Gidra. Mm. Yeah, it's Gidra. Oh, I didn't remember to rename it to get these versions and whatever remote, but it's still cool. So to run Kidra, you just run the main. Kidra uh -huh. and then run. Should have it running, and it's quite resource consuming, especially on Windows. I won't recommend you to use such tools on Windows because it's quite um, uh, a resource consumer. So. Let's see how Gitra looks like, and then I'll end the presentation because I believe I've shared the tools. I'll show you what reverse engineering is and how to do some reverse engineering on some basic um, CTFs. And there's nothing more to reverse engineering, but reverse engineering requires intense knowledge on on assembly and C and um, what else do we have in okay now reverse engineering is somehow really close to porn this the, the tools that you use are quite and um, almost the same i don't think there's a tool that you can use porn on that can be used on reverse engineering because we have uh ROPs and um buffer overflows in porn we still have them in reverse engineering but reverse engineering is more of understanding how the code or how the program works and interacts with the system than porn. Porn is uh, more of trying to find an exploit. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, hi. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Good. So, um, because of time, I have been requested to do both like, um, I'm going to introduce network security and also do a general challenge that takes care of all the categories so that we can actually see how we combine these different categories to be able to achieve different tasks of uh, CTFs. So um, I just come up with a small presentation on how we can best understand network security. And uh, when we look at network security, we look at the components, we're looking at uh, ID threads, uh, we're looking at vulnerabilities, the security policies, how we design these networks, and how we implement these different technologies that we have. So basically, with network security, we're looking at how we implement uh, secure networking policies, and also how we can actually, um, uh, I would say, more of like uh, configure our routers and switches, uh, and switches properly, so that we can have less issues of like attacks. So. One thing I came up with is I realized that there is more of like, um, there, it would be very difficult for me to dive very deeply into networking, but I'm going to share some of the tools that have already been mentioned before and show exactly a small challenge that has been done before by me. And uh, after that, go through one that caters for everything. So here we look at, we're looking at networking, we're looking at, first of all, we need to understand the OSI model. We need to understand the OSI model and uh, the different layers that it carries with it. And then we have to understand uh, the software bit and the hardware bits and how they interact with each other. 
So we realized that at different layers of the OSI model, we have like different protocols and different uh, technologies interacting with each other to be able to achieve what we call the communication that we have with our different devices from how information is like one point to another endpoint. But with network security, we're trying to implement security throughout these layers at all points and ensure that we can best understand it. So when we're looking at like packets, we use a, the best tool that we could best describe is Wireshark. I would like to share the tool, Wireshark. Um, that we use to normally like help us like analyze different packets. And most times when we use Wireshark, we use it mostly to capture packets and be able to actually understand what is going on back end. I'm going to demonstrate uh, just a small, a small example because we're running out of time. So here we're looking at um, a network security challenge from, uh, from cyber talent called uh, Let's start with a small app. Uh, let's download our big app. So let's remove our pick up here. Um, App Storm, yeah. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> Can anyone hear me? So when we move our pickup to this, um, we have our file. We're going to open it using our Wireshark. So when we open this thing, we notice that uh, Wireshark helps us address and understand the different um, parts of the OSI model in this case. We look at how this different, uh, this packet in this case is being understood by this program. And we can literally understand what, what we captured in our network is an app, more like an app storm. And when we look, we have a tool that we would like to call Scapy that we can use to analyze and easily interact with um, apps so that we can, we can easily extract data and be able to do uh, uh, tasks faster without actually stressing that much. So what happened is when we realized, when I came to look at this challenge, I realized that we're looking at the opcode uh, uh, property of app. And when we look at that, we can see that this different in this case, this pipe uh, shapes up to different portions. When we look at different points, like here, we're looking at the Ethernet address. We look, or we look at the MAC address, and we know that our uh, app is mainly used to oh, like generate a, a correlation between uh, MAC addresses and these IP addresses. So when we look at how these packets are, we know that what we're looking for in this case is the open. And when we look at our opcode here, we are seeing an ASCII character at this point in the first packet. So when I was able to obtain this, I noticed that if you look at this point within this opcode, for every opcode as it moves uh, through every single packet, we realize that there is a change in the opcode value. So I'm just going to do a quick, let me copy this file into something called file with pickup. And uh, let me use, um, let me use a tool called Scapy to me understand how these packets work. Okay, so um, so now we're looking at Scapy. I want to load, load my pickup. We have a uh, called R R pickup. We'll load this file. Oh, just give me. Okay, so we have RT pickup. Sorry, my bad. So when we say um, pickup the show, this function, we can actually see what is going on. We have been able to use copy to actually relate directly to our, our, to our Wireshark capture. In this case, I realized that if I keep moving across every single packet, I look and notice that this value, the opcode keeps changing. So what I realize is I have to interact with this opcode property of this app so I can exactly. 
So I generated, um, I used um, one. When we're looking at the ASCII character, I'm going to get a, a character I in this case, or let me say P of the up, from the up. And we're looking at the characteristic of the get. And from there, for in pickup, in our pickup, we have to understand what we're actually working with. So here we are seeing that we're actually seeing this is what we have been able to extract from this file. And we notice that it is. When you look at this string, clearly you can actually understand it's a base 64 string. So if we had to import uh, base 64, import base 64. And we are to try and let me say in this case, if let's call this, let's call this like, let's call, let's give this a name like a string or something. Sign it to T and then we base port 64. Yes. Best, uh, best, uh, best 64 decode T. You find that we're actually getting our flag. You get, this is exactly what we're trying to hope for. So SCAP is a tool that help, helps us easily understand how to interact with these different uh, network captures and understand exactly what is going on in our networks. And Wireshark is a sniffer that we can use to actually capture packets. So I would like to go through um, one challenge that I have been asked to go through called counter. It's a forensic challenge that looks at, that looks at um, it's called counter, and we're going to download it. So it says a hacker tries to hide information inside this binary. He's not good in remembering passwords. Usually his passwords consist of four characters. So in your brain, you're like, oh shit, someone has hidden something in a binary file. So how best can I actually understand what is going on? So since it's a binary file, we have to uh, look into the binary. That is taking advantage of reverse engineering, and then understand what is going on in the binary try to extract what's going on there, and then also try and maybe see what else can happen. So moving quick, um, let's close this. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, when we run counter, we find that it says enter. Uh, to get rid of this annoying message, enter digit. Enter digit one, it gives us output and closes. When we run it and use the, it gives us a value and it closes. So I decided to look at this binary and understand exactly what was going on. So uh, uh, when we look at what's happening, we actually have like different. Uh, we have a function, uh, a function call to at an x function that keeps giving us different different outputs and different outputs. Every input, we notice that there is a different output as we had seen earlier on. So I decided to actually create, if I realized that I am, when I put a value one, it gives me something, a value two, it gives me something else, a value three, it gives me something else. So I was like, how best can I interact with this binary? So I decided to, write a Python script to automate the whole process and allow me to extract those values without actually me working with the binary. I just said, um, let me just say, when I say found, it should stop. So let me set a while root while true in this case. So while found equals true in this zero, in this case would be true. We're trying to find a way to ensure that we can run this elf bucket after every single um, run, it gives us a value, and that is the value we're trying to extract out of this binary. So let's call our, our process uh, and open that binary in this case. We're going to use um, our binary is called counter. Uh, we're using the sub process module will help us easily interact with this binary. We're looking at standard input and typing it down. Mm 
develops our standard output in this case. So what we are doing is we're trying to now interact with this binary. So what we want is to be able to actually communicate with this binary. So we communicate with the binary in this case. We're looking for our standard output and we communicate with our binary. Our input is going to be our string in this case, one, one or zero in this case of our study, which is T, and then we're going to encode it and send it into a uh, unicode. And then we extract, because you know that uh, normally this information comes as double. So do not extract the first uh, value, we take zero, in this case, and then we decode. So what happens is when we realize this, if we look, look at, uh, Look at our binary in this case. If we look inside, we notice that if we put a one, we get a zero. If we put a value that, let me say 404, it still gives us a value. If we put a value 400, 4, 4, 400, and let me say 30, that's no, it's not. So that means this value has a limit, and it would require us to input one value after the other to be able to extract these different characters that are actually hidden in the binary. So when I saw this, I said I wanted to kill my loop by having this break. If I see this output in this case, I notice that that's when my loop is open. So um, we come back to our Python script. And then after that, we're now saying, maybe we can say print standard out just to give us a picture of exactly what's going to be happening. But in this case, I'm saying if no, it's not in this case, right? It's not, it's now binary in standard output. What do we do? That is when we add, we say print our standard output in this case, that output, and also break from the loop. But in this case, I want that if we fail to do that, let's add our value one and do the process again. So what happens is we run our Python script. We find that this, this keeps running. It's an annoying message, but this binary is running every single time. We know to be able to remove that. What happens is I find Python script again and decided to just print out the last value in this case. The last character, which we are seeing is this of the standard output. So We come back to our standard output here, and then we extract the last value in this case. But because I don't want to waste time, to make it simple, I said just for every single value, let me say, let me call it G, that value, and, or let me, uh, let me call it something. Yeah. So I'm going to open something I would like to call my key, new list. And then I'm going to append whatever character that I find into 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 my into my list. So that means I will say key dot append uh, f in this case the character that this last value that we're getting. And then from there we're going to print the we're going to print. Since we already saw what's happened, that's it. We're going to print the join of our key. So when we go and work on our Python script, what happens is the same value is shared. Okay, what's happening here? So we're getting a value standard output. Just go and check. Oh, so this is zero, but I want. The last value, sorry. So we're pressing the last value for every single output in this case. Um, I don't know why I'm sure. 
Oh yeah, so we're able to actually extrapolate. There is actually, there is actually like, the value is hidden inside this binary. And this is what we've been able to extract. So after being able to extract these characters, that means if I run program every single time, I should have actually been able to get five, zero, four. So um, this is what I'm actually extracting from my binary. So I get this, this, and if I'm actually looking at this very well, and if you understand what we call magic numbers in this case, Magic numbers are more of like the identifiers when you're looking at um, a hexagon that actually state and show you um, how to identify a file. And if I see 504B030B, uh, that actually to me is a zip file. But I'm going to take this output and channel it down, what we call CyberChef. CyberChef, which is a tool that is really very handy when you're coming to actually do most of this analysis because you need to be able to so when we look at cyber chef and we just run magic magic helps you basically it gives you like like the system understands how best can i actually see what's available so actually we are seeing that there's something here that we're actually seeing a pk file we extracted our data from our binary and then we're getting our pk file i'm sorry i hope i'm not taking too long but i can make this very short Oh, okay, so if I'm to introduce from X in this case, I'm actually going to get something uh, by a zip file that has my flag. So if I'm to save this as flag the zip, okay, I'm going to save it as file the zip, and then I'm going to move it here so that we can all see. Oh, sorry, there's a move function. Just I keep forgetting to put my phone. So now what do we have here? We have uh, our flag. So when we look at our flag, we're actually seeing the folder. If we were to try and extract it with unzip, uh, unzip flag, it asks for a password, but we don't know the password. So there's a tool called fcrack zip that we can use to actually brute force this thing. But what happens is, when I run uh, fcrack zip, um, yeah, now we're trying to crack the banner because we do not know the password. We have something called a uh, rocky text. That is like our word list, and then we have our flag. When we run it here, what we're trying to actually do is crack, crack the zip folder and find the flag, but we cannot actually see the flag. So it keeps running around and running around. But because I have actually done this before, I understand that this is not going to work. So when you look at this, it tells you he is not good in remembering passwords. Usually his passwords consist of four characters. So you're like, oh, that means he must have a four character password. So just to ensure we save time, let me kill this. So what I decided to do is a tool called Crunch. Crunch. And Crunch takes him, Crunch has Crunch, if you, if you ask Crunch to help, it give you the minimum number of characters and maximum number of characters. And then you give it the options for a list that you actually want it to. So if I had like, let me say Crunch, and I wanted to make a word list of three words that are three words that are three long, like three characters long, and let me say three, four long, and it should, uh, should have like a uh, OP, in this case, A, B, C, D. What happens is it gives me a total of 320 characters just for this, just for that, just for this input. So what happens in this case, we're looking to generate four minimum characters and four maximum characters. But to save time, I realized that I'm just going to use the word pass, in this case, pass. Yeah? And then what does it do? It generates 2,401 characters of this different mix. So I'm going to put this and make my word list in this case. Word list. And direct all that, type that, we're piping the, the output of this into this word list. When we cut word list in this case, uh, what we're doing is so we use again F crack zip, use F crack zip, um, use F crack zip. In this case, we're going to use our new word list, yeah. And then what happens is we find that we've actually um, we find that our password. We're using fcraxy 
in this case, going to be, oh, okay. I want to generate a very huge crack list just to ensure that we just understand this. So if I would use Crunchy, I remember the password I think was something like that. Uh, at something like that. But to save time, uh, let's use Crunch, sorry, just to ensure that I would say I'm going to use like A to Z in this case. And then, of course, yeah, to generate those characters. So crunch literally gives us different different characters. So what we do is, in this case, we use crunch. I don't want to give a spoiler for everything, but just know that once you use crunch, it's supposed to use crunch to generate a password list of four characters that you use to break this. And once you're able to use that, you use fcrackzip to extract your file, and then from there you can actually have your flag. And um, if we were to look, the flag is hidden somewhere here, but the reasons that this thing has to be solved by everyone, let's just leave it at that and just please understand how shared we know. I thank you for listening and um, I hope I, this last um, presentation wasn't very long. I just wanted you to know that what we were able to use is we used a script called um, uh, script in this case to extract a binary file, which is in case the, uh, the flag in this case is what we extracted out, and it has our flag hidden here. So it's password protected, and you have to crack this, this password in order to get the flag, then you can actually submit it on the platform. Thank you for listening, and uh, yeah, thanks for being here to listen to this. Thank you. Okay, hello guys. Uh, thank you for attending this session and webinar with us. Uh, we apologize for the hiccups that we had at the start. Uh, some of these platforms are tricky to use or we might encounter obvious technical difficulties, but we were able to get around that through this Google Meet session. And yeah, that's it for us. That's our team and that is what we do. Thank you. Oh, we also appreciate uh, Diary of Hackers for hosting us. This was a really good opportunity. And uh, I hope we do this again soon. OK, sorry, I guess I have uh audio challenge so thank you so much team fritz for this amazing uh knowledge you've shared with the community it's well treasured and so the video will be uploaded as soon as um we get it downloaded yes so guys um keep up the good work i wish you guys a lot of um successes and a lot of OSCPs. Yes. Thanks so much, everybody. Please make sure you follow our Twitter um, so you could get acquainted with more information and subsequent events. And also, you can join the WhatsApp group or the um, Telegram group. So I'll be dropping the link soon. Please, everybody, have a good um, night rest. Bye over here.